whole thing. It lives with you. I cannot, when a helicopter flies over this house, and they do every day, I can't hear a helicopter without thinking of Vietnam. There were many different people giving counts of who was there. The, the joint military team people, Harrington was, you know, somebody would call down, how many do you have left? And there would be a number. Uh, Wolf Lehman would come down and he would take a count and there would be another number. And virtually anybody you asked, uh, you, you, you'd get a different number. Well, those numbers kept going back. And uh, I think there was a comment in Washington, D.C. that I read years later that said that uh, it seems like there's always 2,000. <laughs> We're never getting less, so sooner or later this has to stop. At the White House, it appeared as though the embassy had lost control of the number of people still to be evacuated. In the movies they show in crisis, people running around, picking up telephones, yelling into telephones, doing things. What in fact happens in crisis is that everybody is in their foxhole and occasionally throws a message out that he wasn't responsible. We understood in the White House, in the Situation Room, that uh, there would undoubtedly never be an end to the lineup of South Vietnamese who wanted to get out of Saigon because they knew the track record of the North Vietnamese as to how they would treat uh, South Vietnamese who had been helpful to the United States. So that lineup could have gone on and on and on. But just as Washington came to the conclusion that the airlift might never end, the number of people in the compound finally stopped growing. By about midnight, we were able to bring the remaining people that were in the back into the front part of the embassy, which cut our perimeter by about half, so we were really able to secure it by then. We began to whittle away very effectively at the numbers uh, to the point that we know from an actual headcount that we took as we put them on the helicopters that by almost one in the morning on the 30th, that we had already uh, taken out um, more than 1,800. And we also know, because at that point in time, we marshaled the remainder into the main embassy comp compound proper and sealed it off, that there were around 1,100 left. And we had a good number, a good solid number on this. The embassy walls were under control. There was no bleeding of people in from the streets of Saigon. I did get a number sometime along about uh, 2 o'clock in the morning from the embassy, I called and said, how many more how, how many more people do you have to evacuate? I want a straight answer because we're, we've got pressure on us. We've got to cut this off. And they said about 800. But it was too late. In the White House, Henry Kissinger was phoning new instructions to the fleet. There was so much confusion and we couldn't tell what was going on and at what scale it was going on. So that I finally said, I think I said 15, but again, don't hold me to that number. I said 15 more helicopter loads can leave, and that is it. Helicopter loads can leave, and that is it. In the embassy compound, Colonel Madison and his men were unaware of Washington's decision. Just a few more flights, they knew, would save the remaining South Vietnamese waiting in the compound. We got some more helicopters in, and we were able to get that group down to about uh, 450 uh, by the uh, very early uh, morning, well, say about 4.15 or something like that. <clears throat> so at that point, we weren't getting any more helicopters in, and I was getting very concerned about these what was going on. We hadn't had any for some time. There was a call that came in from the fleet that was coming from the president directly, that from that moment forward, only 
official Americans would be evacuated from the embassy and that we were going to close down the evacuation operation. Now, the ambassador was very reluctant to come out. And uh, the admiral said, what if he doesn't come out? And I said, we'll put a Marine on either side of him and we'll physically lift him up and carry him to the helicopter. And he said, well, hadn't we better check with the White House on that? Which we did. Graham Martin uh, was not very happy with what I decided. I admired his courage. I admired his dedication to the welfare of our South Vietnamese allies, but he was an employee of the State Department, and I had to give him the instructions that he had to follow. And the White House came back and said, if necessary, take him out, take him out whatever way you have to take him out. Bring him out on the next, next helicopter. I actually landed and General Kerry said to me, you will bring the ambassador out on your next pass. And so I went to the embassy and this is 4.30 in the morning, I land on the roof. Uh, they loaded some Vietnamese on my airplane. And I said, the, uh, I think it was uh, Sergeant Bennington at the time picked up the, uh, the, the mic on the side of the airplane, and I said, no, take them off. We're not leaving until the ambassador's on board. The young man on the roof, uh, Sergeant Bennington, called me down. I handheld. We had these handheld Motorola phones, and he said, the bird in the zone says that it's to take the ambassador out. The pilot, Jerry Berry, had come in, and he had it written in grease panel. This, he had received... Uh, a communication by the, the frequency he was monitoring saying that the next bird in takes the ambassador out. We've got to stop this. Otherwise, there will always be 2,000 people. I was prepared to wait as, as, as long as I possibly could before I left the top of that embassy. And, uh, and I wanted to make sure I had the ambassador with me. I got on the radio and I talked to Kerry personally. I said, there's 450 people between the Marines on the wall and the front door of the embassy. Uh, uh, am I to understand that we will leave without him? He said, let me repeat. And he repeated the president's order. And I said, aye, aye, sir. And I went down to Martin, and I said, uh, the president ordered you out. And Martin had a personal, the, the, the senior man in the personal protective, the Marines that were assigned to his, his bodyguard, was a, a, a big uh, black staff sergeant named Segura. And... Uh, I told Martin it's time to go, and he said, not just yet, young major, I have a few other things. He's put me in my place. And Segura reached down and took him under the arm, and Martin looked at Wolf Lehman, and he said, I guess, Wolf, it's time. He came up the stairs from the, from the embassy and then walked right beside the cockpit uh, where I was, at least what I thought was the ambassador. I, I had no idea what Ambassador Martin looked like. Uh, a very haggard man, uh, and... It looked look worn and tired because of the huge, tremendous responsibility of being the last ambassador in, uh, in South Vietnam. Down below in the compound, no one knew of the order to end the evacuation. And I can recall telling the Vietnamese, don't worry, there's large helicopters coming and we're all going. Colonel Madison had told Mr. Lehman how many remained and that we needed X number of helicopters. I believe the number was five large helicopters would clean out the remaining 420 people. That Mr. Lehman had made a commitment, no doubt in good faith, that those helicopters would be forthcoming. Major Keene came down and said, uh, you have been ordered to get out of here with your people and abandon these six loads. There won't be any more helicopters. I got into this very involved conversation because Madison was, I mean, he was emotionally involved in this. He said, I, I said, it's time to go. So I said, I'll be damned if that's so. I'm going up to see the ambassador myself. And I told him, uh, uh, Colonel, that's him, as it, the, the bird lifted off the roof. And uh, Madison just had this horrified look on his face, and he looked at me, and, and he threw up his hands. And, and as we left with the ambassador, I think the exact time was 4.58 in the morning of the, of the 30th. And I, of course, made the broadcast 
Tiger, 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 which was a signal that the ambassador was on board and that we were on our way out. So I thought, well, I, I'm going to fall on my sword now and stay with these people, uh, or do I put my other five guys I had with me at risk? So I made a decision that we just, we had to leave. So I went around and whispered to each one of them, uh, just act like you're going to latrine or something and, and uh, mosey over the embassy and, and go to the roof. We had these people to whom we had made the promise. We now knew that the promise would be unfulfilled and we were faced with uh, having to essentially extricate ourselves from these people, leave them behind, abandon them, and uh, sneak up into the roof of the embassy, onto the roof of the embassy and depart. I sat there uh, on the uh, hood of a car with a radio, pretending to talk to helicopters that I knew weren't out there. I reassured them, that, don't worry, in Vietnamese, don't go law, don't worry, big helicopter's coming and then made an excuse that I had to uh, use the restroom and uh, sneak through the weeds or through the bushes into the embassy and headed up to the roof, stopping to pick up my equipment on the second floor, um, knowing as I did it that I was breaking the last of many, many promises that had been made to the Vietnamese by our country, and knowing as I did it that it would be something that would probably bother me the rest of my life. <laughs> 